sign up for free Stratfor Intelligence. Simply enter your email address to receive two free reports each week. U.S. authorities will release on parole one of the infamous Cuban Five, Rene Gonzalez, on October 7th. Gonzalez and the Cuban Five were convicted 13 years ago on charges of espionage. The Five planned to infiltrate a U.S. military base as well as Cuban opposition groups in Miami. Gonzalez and his co-conspirators have become a symbol for U.S. repression for the Cuban government. Their faces feature prominently in Cuban propaganda, and they represent the repression of the United States. Gonzalez has, however, been informed that he will have to spend the next three years of his parole in the United States. While it is difficult to say that the decision to keep Gonzalez in the United States for his parole period was an explicitly political decision, the controversy that it has generated is a good reminder of where the relations stand between Cuba and the United States. Cuba policy has always been a touchy subject for the United States. From a strategic perspective, Cuba sits astride critical shipping corridors between the Gulf Coast ports and the international trade markets. The primary concern for the United States is that these trade routes remain uninterrupted. As long as Cuba remains independent of a major foreign power like the Soviet Union, the island does not pose an existential threat to the United States. Cuba is, however, an important issue for Cuban Americans who fled the 1959 revolution. This influential group supports the embargo against the island and continues to advocate for an end to the regime of Fidel and Raul Castro. In Cuba's case, the situation is even more complicated. The fall of the Soviet Union plunged Cuba into a deep depression during the 1990s. Those hard times forced the Cuban government to open the island to tourist investment. This investment, however, was not enough to provide enough capital to sustain the island. Worse for Cuba, the influx of foreigners and foreign cash has exposed deep rifts along racial and class lines within Cuban society. When Raul Castro took power from his brother in 2006, there began a slow change in the mindset of Cuban leaders. The government currently plans to relocate one million people, or about one-fifth of the country's workforce, into private sector jobs and out of the state-controlled economy. Included in these reforms are a number of other commercial activities that will be allowed to the Cuban population. The sugar ministry has been closed, Cubans are now allowed to sell cars, and the island has opened its first business school program. Cubans are increasingly being granted business licenses, and there is some talk of allowing them to travel freely to and from the island. The ultimate goal is to mimic China's slow, gradual liberalization and to avoid the catastrophic collapse of the Soviet Union. It is this concern for domestic stability that is driving the decisions of the Castro regime, but there are international forces at work as well. While it is conceivable that Cuba could look to the United States as a source of foreign investment, the long, tense history between the two countries prevents that from happening. Despite the occasional positive gesture between the United States and Cuba, now is a particularly unlikely time for a reconciliation. The reason for this is that Cuba has tied itself to the Venezuelan regime of Hugo Chavez. Every day, Cuba imports over 100,000 barrels of subsidized oil from Venezuela. That lifeline of fuel from Caracas saves Cuba more than $4 billion a year and supplies more than half of the island's energy needs. Should Cuba attempt to reconcile itself with the United States, it could threaten that political relationship with Venezuela, possibly end the subsidization of oil imports, and threaten the stability of its domestic economy.